Live from Seville, this is The Twilight Show with Harry Waters and you are listening live. Good afternoon, good evening, good night. How are you? I hope you're well. Uh, I hope you've had an interesting day stroke week thus far. It is Wednesday. This is The Twilight Show and I am Harry Waters and I'll be taking you through the next 90 minutes um, to talk all about what makes a teacher a teacher. Now, before we get into that, I'm going to go through my inane ramblings, as I do every week, uh, all about what's happened, what's been going on. Um, I've seen my guests has arrived. I'm, I'm going to invite them as a speaker. They will have received the invite and they'll soon be joining us. So um, we will be talking about what makes a teacher a teacher. And I'm just going to click them on mute there for a second. But before that, as I say, what have I been up to this week? It's been thus far a busy week. I've found a few new speaking engagements coming up and February looks like it's going to be absolutely insane. Um, there's lots and lots of things to do. Um, I've got a few projects that I'm writing. I've got my classes, obviously. Um, and then uh, there's the Global Teachers Festival coming up at the end of February. There's the Fase Conference, which there is a, I've been nominated for an award there, which is kind of exciting. No, it's, it's insanely exciting. Um, although, you know, yeah, no, it's insanely exciting. Um, and that's up in a, a city that I've never been to, so I'm excited. My wife has her exhibition at the the High, International Hybrid Art Fair, so there's lots of things going on, um, and, and yeah, it's just super exciting. Now, one thing that, that I noticed this morning, somebody mentioned about how much they love their sleep. Now, everybody loves their sleep, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm a huge fan of my sleep, but I am a morning person. Um, I wonder, are you a morning person? Um, do you like to get up in the morning? But that said, while I am a morning person, I also absolutely love a siesta in the afternoon. You know, it's for me, it is the greatest of, of life's pleasures is to, to have a, a nice chill siesta, lay down, relax, turn everything off and just, you know, have that, that bit of time to yourself. So I wonder, are you a, are you a morning person? Are you a stay in bed person? And Or do you love the odd siesta every now and again? I don't know. Let me know. So that's what's been troubling me today um, as to whether I should be a morning person or not, um, or I should just stay in bed that little bit longer. Um, what else has, has been going on this week? Oof. Uh, oh, I've booked for Alethea's first ever speaking event, which she'll be doing in in April. Alethea, obviously, you'll know, is, is my, my nine-year-old daughter. So she will be speaking on a stage probably bigger than any stage I've ever spoken on. So that's uh, pretty awesome for a nine-year-old. Mm, just take a quick sip of water there. And yeah, I'm working on... Oh, and another dilemma, because I'm working on one project, which is about sustainability, and I've been asked to apply for another project, which is a big project about sustainability. But I have some interesting feelings about the the person giving the contract and just exactly how genuine they are in terms of the climate crisis and dealing with said climate crisis. So... For me, at the moment, I'm trying to decide whether to apply for that one or not. Um, in the meantime, we're going to hop off for the news. We'll be back very shortly, and we'll, you'll hear from us soon. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides, and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This is Teachers Talk Radio. And this is Teachers Talk Radio News. Education Secretary Gillian Keegan has addressed school leaders at the Church of England National Education Conference. 
in a speech that recognised the achievements of Church of England schools and of teachers and leaders in schools across the country, she defined education as something that lets you do things you couldn't beforehand. She also reflected on her own experiences of being educated in a faith school, although it was a different denomination, Catholic. She spoke about the importance of a faith which is still a core part of who I am, and recognised the work of faith schools, particularly Anglican schools, and the role they play in educating young people. She described the Church of England as one of my department's most valued partners, as the largest provider of academy trusts. Ms Keegan went on to say that her department would protect the schools so that when they became academies, they retained the statutory freedoms and protections that apply to church schools. She also used the speech to comment on standards and said, I agree with the Prime Minister on maths to 18, and praised a former teacher of hers, Mr Ashcroft, who helped her realise my one opportunity. The speech was not without reference to planned industrial action by teachers in the National Education Union when she commented that for teachers to have an impact, they need to be in school and stated that we will be funding schools in real terms at the highest level in history. The speech closed with a statement that her door is always open, but asked that you now work with me to keep as many children in schools as possible during the disruptive strike action. Ms Keegan ended with a focus on collaboration to make sure our education system flourishes for all children. Half of state schools in England and Wales will close on Wednesday as a result of the planned industrial action, according to reports in many media outlets. The action by NEU coincides with that being taken by civil servants, university staff and train drivers. While schools may close, many will remain open to pupils identified as vulnerable or at risk, as well as some schools offering places to the children of critical workers. The latest data from the Higher Education Statistics Agency shows that the number of EU students choosing to study in the UK has dropped by half since the UK left the EU. Enrolments by EU nationals dropped by 53%, from around 64,000 to 31,000 between 2020 and 2022. Whilst the number of non-EU nationals did increase at the same time period, the data shows that the UK universities still faced significant shortfalls. The exit from the EU and the changing international fee policy saw EU student fees rise from around £9,000 to as high as £38,000. The decline has been particularly sharp in student numbers from Italy, Germany and France. Similar falls have been seen in Scotland, with many mourning the demise of the EU's Erasmus scheme as well as the loss of diversity brought to courses by students from the EU. Universities UK said the changes in numbers had dented the finances of some universities and impoverished campus life. The HuffPost featured an article focusing on new data which shows that 87% of teenagers want better and more inclusive sex education. The survey by student discount app Student Beans found that 39% did not feel represented in the sex education they received. 27% of girls surveyed admitted they did not feel comfortable setting and communicating boundaries with a partner, compared to 23% of male respondents. 89% of all respondents said they did not see LGBTQIA plus themes in the teaching. With Generation Z having the highest percentage of non-straight people, almost double that of millennials, perhaps it's time for another review. Finally, Schools Week focuses on Ofsted's announcement on how it will conduct thematic reviews of alternative provision. Visits will take place in the spring and summer terms, with a national report out in the autumn. The visits will not result in judgments and the report will not identify local areas specifically, although they will be listed separately. There will be a focus on how AP supports children to stay in mainstream and full details are available on the Schools Week website. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. 
This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm going to talk about GDPR, an acronym that has bounded around and caused quite a stir when it was first introduced back in 2018. GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation, and it's governed by the ICO, which is the Information Controller's Office, an independent body set up by the government to uphold information rights. Ah, thanks Steve, that's crystal clear now, I hear you say. What does it mean to the general classroom teacher. Well, your school will have a policy, which you will have signed somewhere to say you've read it. If you haven't, it might be worth taking a look. In it, there'll be an outline of measures to protect data and usually a process of investigation in the event of a data breach. A data breach in a school is when personal data is compromised and a person can be identified, for example, first name and last name. In a school, Breaches can be as serious as the introduction of ransomware where data is locked by a cyber attack or as simple as the wrong letter being sent to the wrong carers. Now the question is how do we protect ourselves? First, if you're still wandering around with a USB pen hanging off your lanyard, make sure it's encrypted. There is lots of free encryption software around. If you can, migrate your data into the school's cloud. This puts the onus back on the school to keep the data safe. It's also backed up regularly. I know what you'll say next. If I'm in the cloud and the internet goes down, I can't get my planning. Yes, you're correct, but your school laptop will be encrypted, so you can save current files locally to enable working offline. If you have a machine with a small memory like a Chromebook, sync what you need and leave the rest in the cloud. With the top ads on a search for school data breach, all reading claim around £10,000 today. Obviously, no win, no fee. Do you want to cost your school that much money? I'll leave you with this. If you take a digital register and display it while you take it, could it be classed as a data breach. As always, I'd love to hear what you want to know about tech. Let us know at TT Radio Official. I'm Steve Woods, and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, quite a lot to think about and unpack over that news and uh, also the 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 tech briefing there but we're not going to get into that right now i am going to in very briefly introduce my guest um helen slee has come along today to talk about whether uh to what makes a teacher a teacher so i'm going to ask helen if they can uh unmute their their podbean app they'll be able to find it right there on the phone this is always the best bit because if i try to unmute you you probably won't be heard um However, if you can't find it, I can try and unmute you. It's a tricky one to find, hidden there. They'll find it soon, don't worry. So we are going to talk about what makes a teacher a teacher. I'm going to try and unmute, see if that works. Can I hear you? Can you you hear me? Oh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. You didn't need to find it in the end. (laughs) It's all good. It's all good. So, um, very... um, a very brief introduction there that you know you're you're here to talk as a teacher who's what's a teacher uh, you're also an activist um and you'll be speaking very soon as well but i'd like to know first what is your your journey in elt all right well uh I think like a lot of English language teachers, I fell into this career by accident uh, because I originally started training uh, in university back when dinosaurs roamed the earth in 20, 2009 um, in, in, in uh, <laughs> dramatic arts and education. So I was originally studying theater and uh, teaching drama to young people and uh, I was part of the cooperative education program, which is like uh, doing internships in the summer for extra university credit. And the second placement I ever did was at a drama English language camp. Can you hear me? Hmm. Can you hear me clearly? Hello, Helen. You're breaking up quite a lot. Can you hear me now? I can't hear you at all at the moment. So that's um, I've cut the connection to our chat. Let's see if uh, you're still in there. If you can hear me at all, I'm going to try muting and unmuting you. Um, Hello, can you hear? Hello. 
I can hear you. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yes, I can hear you again. You're back. Great. Yes. Okay. Super. There we I go. What happened Woo. there? Oh, don't worry. Yeah. This is the the beauty of live radio. Is <laughs> this? It, it's not the first time it's happened. I'm going to be completely honest with you. Um, this is Probably about my seventieth show. Yeah, and I'd say that that's that that kind of thing, something along those lines, has happened on at least oof. 10 occasions so okay good. you know <laughs> not don't worry <laughs> so it, it might even happen again in the next uh, hour or so so well, just bear we'll in mind um, yeah exactly technology so, right can't live with it can't oh, live without it exactly so <laughs> so you were uh, you were teaching drama to, to young people and then the summer and then that's uh, when we lost you yeah that's okay so one summer I went to a um summer job teaching English and drama to Italian kids in summer camps Um, and just opened my eyes to the idea of teaching the English language to, um, you know, speakers of other languages or um, uh, bilingual speakers, um, something that I just never considered before. Um, And then I went back and worked there for three consecutive summers and became a camp supervisor my final summer. And then uh, after that, always kept it in mind, Um, went on to to do a little bit of drama work. But in the end, um, I spent some time working in a uh, uh, supermarket, as we all did. Good old Tesco. Uh, But then I (laughs) went to I I got my um, TEFL certificate, went to Italy, taught in a school for six months, didn't have a very good experience and was advised to get my CELTA. Uh, because I was sort of told that you'll really improve your teaching skills, you'll, it'll open more doors in terms of your qualifications. So uh, I went to Scotland and took my um, certificate for English language teaching from Cambridge, uh, then went to Spain and taught there for three years at a small academy, and then uh, applied for a job at the British Council in a different area of Spain, uh, went there, stayed there for two years, um, and then COVID happened. Oh, so, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> well, yeah. It's hard to describe that That time. was a thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, after all of those those years of, of, of traveling and studying, where I spent some time with host families, did all sorts of stuff in the past. But then COVID hit and everything shut down for health reasons, obviously. And... Yeah. And then uh, I came back to the UK and I started teaching online, teaching Chinese kids online, uh, which went well for a while, but it was a really big pay cut and a real loss of benefits. So uh, I applied for a job at a local college here in West Yorkshire, where I live, got in uh, and I taught there for a year. And then uh, after that, uh, the uh, company decided not to renew my contract at the last minute and uh, at the end of last term. And so I struggled for a while job hunting, trying to find something. In the past, it was different. I could pick up and go anywhere, right? But uh, now that yeah. my partner and I live together, we have a house, we have commitments, we have a mortgage to pay. It's not that easy for me to just go where the work is anymore. So uh, now I am working at First Direct, the bank, Um, and right now I'm a customer service representative, but uh, in the future, I'm looking forward to getting into training and coaching uh, because it's a lot more close to uh, teaching and a lot of working with people, things that I really love, Um, and uh, transitioning back into a more coaching, training, educational role in the future. It's been quite a journey. So, yeah, um, with with a, f- a few bumps along the way, I think um, mm-hmm. a lot of us experienced various bumps, especially around that COVID <laughs> moment. Um, that was certainly yeah. that was a that was definitely something that I don't think I'll forget in in a hurry. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, you so you went to back to the UK and and you were working mm-hmm. there, and then as you say, your your contract was was not renewed and you were told like the last two weeks basically unlucky yes. no contract for you sorry yep. uh, it's just the way it is um and then 
Of course, there aren't as many opportunities at the moment with English language teaching in, in Britain because, you know, you've, that they've basically tried to ban anyone who isn't <laughs> British coming in. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. Brexit as well. There's another thing mm-hmm. that happened recently that has uh, been fantastic for English language yeah. teaching, um, particularly back, in yeah. the UK. So, yeah, there's, and it was time of year as well. You've, yeah, because in September, my my contract was up and I was told and oh, well, nobody's everybody's finished hiring. They've done their hiring in July and August. Um, I did apply for about seven or eight jobs after, but um, some teaching online, some were more like coaching or, or other like similar, but not the same uh, types of roles. But uh, yeah, could not find anything. Uh, which was uh, frustrating and difficult at the time. Yeah. And it's and it's not like you're not qualified because you recently got another qualification, did you not? Yes, I'm working through my uh, TESOL diploma from uh, Trinity College. So I, the, the course is in four parts and I've completed the first three. So I'm on the final part now. I've completed the teaching practice module, the um, I've re- completed the phonology interview, and the recently just received my results that I, and heard that I passed the written exam. So uh, the remaining part of the course is, is for projects. So when I finish those projects, I'll have my teaching diploma in addition to my teaching certificate and all my years of experience in various different um, areas, you know, camps, schools, host families. So online. Working, I, I spent, yeah, online. I spent some time um, at my university, which I didn't mention, I suppose, doing, um, you know, academic support. Um, Quite a lot of the students who came in for academic support were um, international students or um, visiting students who were there for one term or one semester. So, yeah, I mean, it's been years and years and years. And so it was a bit of a shock when um, the school I was working, I'd been sort of assured all year, oh, yeah, we'll renew your contract at the end of the year. Oh, yeah, we'll renew your contract at the end of the year. And then exactly two weeks before, which is the requirement by UK law, they have to notify you within two weeks. Um, Yeah, we won't be renewing your contract. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I wish you'd told me that in advance. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, if you told me that two months ago, it would have been fine, you know. I would have had lots of time to look for another job, you know, seek other opportunities. Um, Yeah, and so... It was it was a, a, a real shock and uh, a, a bit of a, a difficult scenario. I won't say it was the same as 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 COVID, um, because what I was I was once COVID started, I was I was expecting my contract to not be renewed um, with the, with the British Council. And in fact, the British Council yeah. had made like a a global announcement to all workers on temporary contracts that their contracts wouldn't be renewed. Not just teachers, but administration staff, like social workers the lot and that was you know as in response to covid and that was not personal you know my my manager cried as she told me that she was really sorry but she couldn't renew my contract you know um so like that was circumstance i understand that you know yeah and and we had some time to prepare covid had been going on it started in march my contract ended in june we had some time to you know talk about it prepare ourselves think get your heads around it yeah yeah Nobody expects, we always say nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expects a pandemic, right? We, <laughs> we, we, we had to, to figure it out as we went along. But, you know, there was a lot of, it was a big shakeup, I think, in, in the English language teaching community um, globally. Um, a lot of teachers suddenly found that their jobs were completely changing because they had to go hybrid or online. or, well, or Overnight as well. Yeah. Like, it's insane. Yeah. Um, and exactly. so that was That's, a really um, hard adjustment. Yeah, it can't. No, it's, it's never, never ideal. However, mm. you do have opportunities coming mm. up, certainly to put yourself in a shop window. Um, the biggest <laughs> shop window in English language teaching, quite possibly, um, yeah. in in April. Yeah, I'm. I last year I was able to attend the uh, ITEFL conference uh, for the first time. Um, I'd never been 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 able to, you know, afford to go or, or find the means. But uh, last year I obviously applied for... you came to see me talk, didn't you? Of yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. 
Um, I, one day I missed you, but then you were doing a pop-up talk and I did get to, oh, to catch part of it, which was great. Yeah. Oh, wow. You did too. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, I did, yeah. I did. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I didn't um, know. I was trying to just wind you up and joke around there. <laughs> but you got me. You got did, me good. Got you. Well done. Yeah. You did. Um, I was very lucky in that I got the um, a scholarship from TD SIG, the Teacher Development Special Interest Group. Um, scholarships are all closed for this year. They've all been applied for and, and sorted. But I would highly recommend to teachers who are looking at ITEFL and going, I'd really like to attend that conference. I'd really like to, you know, meet other people and, and go to sessions and, and learn new things. Um, that's what the 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 um, that's what they're for. That's what the scholarships are for. Scholarships, bursaries, grants. Um, it was the the conference was held in Ireland last year in Belfast, and I live in England. Uh, so I had to fly and the scholar, the bursary covered my entrance, my stay in uh, my accommodation in a hotel, uh, all of my food um, for the week um, and my attendance at the pre-conference event, um, I think, and my flights. I think in the end, my, and my partner attended too. He took the time off work and then came. Um, he didn't attend the conference. He just got a week of holiday <laughs> in Belfast. <laughs> um, but, a whole um, week in Belfast. I know. Yeah, it was great. Um, and in the end, I think we spent like something like 15 pounds of our own money. The rest yeah. of it was completely covered by the scholarship. So um, to people, as I say, to young teachers or to teachers who are looking to get more into the, the English language teaching community and meet like minded individuals, check the scholarships, apply for them. That's what they're there for. And sometimes they go unclaimed. Last year, several scholarships went unclaimed. Um, so yeah definitely and i went and it was an amazing experience and um i uh, attended a morning workshop on applying to speak at the next conference and i thought well i've attended i've seen lots of things i've been trying to put myself out there and i thought why not i'll apply to speak if i don't get accepted well at least i applied right so i applied and i was accepted so i'll be speaking at the next conference in april i'm very excited uh, it'll be interesting um, and I'm looking for, and, and this year it'll be hosted in Harrogate, which is much nearer to where I live. It's down the road, so, isn't it? Yeah, just down the road. <laughs> just a, just a wee drive. So, um, no flights this year. Yay. <laughs> so that, that's, that's fantastic. Um, that and I'm ideal. really looking forward to it. It's, I think that the conference sort of builds up a little community, the people you, you get to know people, you go back and see them every year. You remember their past talks, you look forward to new talks and you get to see also how other teachers develop, like what they talked about last year, what they're talking about this year, yeah. you know, and, and that sort of thing. And yeah, it's, it's, I think it's an important part of professional development. Um, if you well, can attend, obviously there are things like money and other and yeah. travel and other barriers, but yeah. So well, that was it for me last year was also my first year because I've never been able to afford it. Obviously it being mm -hmm. in the UK, me being in Spain, you know, having a family coming mid, you know, mid school year and stuff. So mm -hmm. I have to, you know, leave my wife with, with my daughter, which, you know, it's, it's not a huge thing, but you know, on top of <laughs> all of that. So mm. it was the first time I went last year as well, but again, mm. I could only go because somebody was paying for me to be able to go there, Yeah, which is what I love about a lot of, you know, other conferences as well, which have the kind of, you know, a good vibe. It's not the same as IATF, obviously, but like the TESOL Spain, there's a brilliant one here in Spain. Mm -hmm. There's one Fese as well, which is coming up in Athea. And just Brass so Tiesel many opportunities too every year. Yeah, yeah. There's just so many opportunities to meet people, and like, you know, if they can be in your own countries. Usually, the the entry fee is a lot cheaper as well. So you mm -hmm. know, maybe thirty or forty euros to go to a conference, and then you've just got mm -hmm. your transport to get there. It's, there's not as many as at IATF, yeah. obviously, um, but there are opportunities in in all sorts of places. Um, mm -hmm. So. But yeah, if if you ever get the chance to go to IATF, it's, it's absolutely worth it. And if you're going this year, you should go and watch Helen's talk, which is about... <laughs> well, uh, this year, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, teaching pronunciation and diversity and inclusion and how teachers can teach pronunciation, which is really important for our learners to make sure that they are understandable to others, that other people can comprehend them but also to ensure that we are teaching them that their accent is valid and good, that we're not teaching them to speak like a British person or speak like an American. We're teaching them to be comprehensible and we're teaching them with the intention to help them 
understand others and be understood. Um, and to how, how can teachers, especially native speaker teachers, teach pronunciation and avoid native speakerism and avoid accentism? How can you present yourself as a model or present multiple models and, and avoid uh, displaying a particular model as the best or, 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 and avoid devaluing your learner's accents. So I'm going to talk a lot about that. I learned a lot during my diploma while I was preparing for my phonology interview about mm -hmm. teaching pronunciation and, and how we teach pronunciation and how we can teach pronunciation English as a lingua franca rather than teaching in, in, a, in a specific way. Um, especially as non-native teachers out there uh, are excellent teachers. They're fantastic and their learners have them as models. So, you know, what's the difference between them and me? None. They're a qualified English prof teaching professional. So there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to teach um, excellent pronunciation to their learners. Well, exactly that, because accent and pronunciation are two very different things. And it's it's a discussion I have quite frequently, obviously, in the in English language profession of the fact that I do have that traditional, the, particularly here in Spain, the sort after, I'm saying obviously in, in inverted commas, the native accent of the British, mm -hmm. clear British accent. And mm -hmm. and it is one of the huge issues. Now, I'm not defending any anybody at all, but it's the, the parent of particularly young children who say, mm. oh, but... I want them to get their accent. And it's just like, no, you don't. No, mm. you don't. You don't want that. Nobody wants that. Like, and it's not going to happen with two hours a week of English. You're not mm. going to get any. If you send your child at the age of three to the UK and they live in the UK and they go to school in the UK, uh, perhaps they'll get a British accent. But it's not going to come from two hours with a bald bearded fella who jumps around like an absolute moron most of the class. <laughs> Um, no names mentioned. Obviously. Are you describing someone in particular there, Harry? Yeah, I've got no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Just yeah. like, just for example, today we in in our, in our class that we have, we we did the the egg drop experiment. Well, we did that mm. in the last class, um, and then we so we worked through how to you know we went out and we got things from nature to to put around the egg, and we we used only recycled materials from the house and put it all together and. And, and stuff like that and then we we threw it off the balcony and you know I'm up there on the balcony dancing and cheering of course um <laughs> but the, the students weren't quite as much as I was um so yeah that's me that's me yeah. I'm 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 that I'm that teacher that does the yeah. dancing and the cheering well I mean both of my parents are British and they moved to Canada before I was born raised me there if you listen to to us speaking to each other like you wouldn't think they were my parents because their accents completely different but you know that <laughs> that doesn't make any all Englishes are English you know whether it's being yep. spoken by a South African or um, you know a Kenyan or a Spanish or a, a Spaniard sorry or a Canadian <laughs> or an Australian or somebody who's from Brazil. It doesn't matter. Like English is English. You know, yeah. it might be more difficult for us to understand accents we're unfamiliar with, but if we take the time and tune our ear to it, we can understand anything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and, and I've given this example again in the past and often it takes, you know, your students that moment, the, mm. The, the little while to, to adapt to each other's um, Englishes. So particularly mm -hmm. if you're in the UK and you're teaching, I don't know, a Moroccan student and uh, a Japanese student, they might take time to, you know, mm -hmm. adjust to each other's English, but that's that's what it's all about. So mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Well, that's I exciting. Mean, yeah. That you're you're so doing that. What's going on? Um, and... Uh, Somebody said to me um, a little while ago, when I announced that um, all of this had gone on with my job and, and things had changed and, you know, I, I announced that I had just done the exam and I was really excited about that. And then a week later, I announced that I was starting this job at First Direct, which is a very well-known bank in the UK. Yeah. And lots of congratulations from people on LinkedIn, lots of really nice comments, but also a lot of people going, does this mean you're leaving teaching? <laughs> um, which is a fair question, you know. Um, and so I, I sent quite a few messages that week saying, 
Well, actually, a lot of what I do for First Direct draws on most of the same skills that I used in the English language teaching classroom. You know, classroom management, managing personalities, I do that on the phone. Like, you yeah. know, <laughs> guiding my, my people automatic, to... <laughs> my automatic reaction when I saw that was not, are you leaving teaching, but, oh, they're not being paid enough for their job, so they have to get another one on top of it. You know, cost of living crisis. My automatic yeah. reaction was that. And I was like, I don't want to push just in case yeah. they come back and say, Harry, I need two jobs because, you know, yeah. eating, um, yeah. that's Mortgage kind of important. So yeah. that was the that was the immediate thing that, that popped up in my head, um, was that you just had to do another job because yeah. it doesn't pay enough. And, and in the, the LinkedIn description that I did of this was, you know, what is it that makes a teacher? Is it the classes? Is it the experience? Um, is it the fact that we like being underpaid and underappreciated? Um, you know, obviously up there on the list. So you've talked about your your experience as a teacher, mm. which is is very wide, very varied, and for some, you know, quite huge companies, to be honest. Um, mm. You've talked about your um, your development, your 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 qualifications, as it were, and how mm. you're continuing to go with your qualifications. You know, yeah. you're training other teachers. You're you're doing this session where you know you're going to one of the the biggest EOT conferences in the world. Mm. Um, so the big question is, are you a teacher? <laughs> yes, I say I'm a teacher. Some okay. people would say, well, you're not working in a classroom right now. Well, okay, so lots of teachers don't teach in a classroom. Lots of teachers teach at their desk on a computer in their house. Does that make them less of a teacher than a teacher who teaches in a classroom? You know, some teachers teach on um, a mobile app. Does that make them not a teacher because they, they don't have a classroom? Is a hybrid it, teacher less of a teacher than a teacher who only teaches face-to-face? -face? But also, it's like, let's think of a retired teacher. Mm. You know, to me, a retired teacher, they're still a teacher. Yeah. But I still refer to my teachers from school as as sir, like if they're mm. like if, if they were a, a male teacher at school, you know, even if I message them now. And it's um that's the the big question for me is, you know, once you've become a teacher, mm. like when does it actually kind of stop? So I worked for a year as an ELT consultant, but while I was doing that, I picked up a couple of private classes just because I, I really love teaching. You know, I really mm. enjoy doing that. And now I do materials writing and a lot of teacher training. But because of that, I want to make sure that, you know, I, I still love that connection with, with students. Now, mm -hmm. if they weren't here in my class every week, I would still consider myself to be a teacher. Yeah. Even yeah, if I'm I mean... not with the students at that moment in time, you know? Mm. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I think people forget that teaching is essentially relationship building. Like we mm -hmm. build relationships with our students and we guide them. They, they set goals, things they want to achieve in, in their, in their language journey, be it, you know, I want to be able to go to England and, and understand, or be it, I want to watch films on Netflix without subtitles in the future, or, you know, I want to talk to people all over the world online and type to them and, and not worry about not understanding what they say, you know, whatever goals they have, we, we build relationships with them and we, you know, help guide them towards achieving those goals through like activities and exercises throughout class. Like that, that's kind of what we do. So, you know, I think that's why teachers will stay in the teaching profession for years and years and years, even when they're overworked or underpaid or not pro pro uh, given um, professional development opportunities or not supported or when their contracts get messed around or when pandemics happen, a lot of teachers will take pay cuts or go partial freelance or go partial um, uh, private or, or take multiple teaching positions because building relationships is what makes this job for them, like building relationships with, with students like supporting them facilitating you know their 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 learning opportunities watching them grow and change and achieve their goals and then move on to more advanced goals and, and get to mm -hmm. other places um you know i talked a bit about how in my the development of my career i started in drama moved into you know camps i spent time with with um 
host families. You know, I've, I've done a lot of different jobs, I've worked in the grocery store. Now I work at a bank, you know, and, and all of those different parts of your journey, you know, you don't expect them and they just come up and you go, oh, and you realize, oh, I actually learned a lot from that. I learned X, Y, and Z from that. So even though I wasn't expecting that, it wasn't unpredictable. <laughs> it was a little bit of a, uh, what's the detour. word? Detour. Yeah, detour. You, you end up learning a lot from it. When I started university back in, you know, 2007, yeah, 2007, I, I was fully in the theater program. I did not expect myself to get interested in education. I did not expect my, myself to get interested in language education. You know, and the person who I am now, the Helen from the past would just look at me and be like, who are you? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> you know, so I think it's the same with learner's journey. Sometimes learners start at a school and they, ex they have certain expectations about what they're going to learn and how it's going to go. And sometimes we as teachers have to set expectations for them, introduce them to different kinds of expectations they could have, um, you know, going back to pronunciation. Well, I'm not going to try and make you sound like me because there are a million ways you could sound as an English speaker. You and know, as long but, as we can understand you, yeah, then that's, that's fine. the important thing, you know, um, or, you know, they come in expecting, well, I want to be able to speak a thousand words by the end of this year. Well, okay. It's good it's that you to know lists of vocabulary, but yeah. can you have a conversation? Let's role play this. Let's like watch this video. Let's try this. Let's, oh, you said that really good thing in that speaking activity. Let's look at that emergent language. What are other ways we can say this? You know what I mean? And, um, and so often, quite often, we, we take our learners off the beaten path. We take them ways they weren't expecting. Um, and, and that's a good thing. And unfortunately, I think going back to English language teachers, um, teachers, we often end up off the beaten path. We, you know, when you started teaching English, Harry, did you expect yourself to be hosting podcasts and designing materials? Um, well, podcast didn't exist when, when I started <laughs> teaching. Um, I couldn't quite see into the future back in, mm. in 2007, incidentally, is when I qualified to become a teacher. So mm. that's when I left the UK. Um, yeah. But no, even, yeah, I, I couldn't picture staying as a teacher basically mm. until about my fifth year of teaching mm -hmm. the whole time it was it was a means to me being able to travel and then mm. suddenly I really enjoyed it I loved yeah. it but I didn't get deep into anything you know I just mm. turned up to my classes did my classes and and went off and did my own thing but then when I came to Spain and you know I had to stay here it was it was a you know it was like, oh I, I really like that and I'm quite good at it but I also like training people so I kind of went down that route um so mm. it was it was a long meander for me um yeah but there there were that. detours along the way that's for sure um mostly the first five years were just a one big detour um before yeah. I actually realized this <laughs> yeah. is what I want to do um mm. I have a question for you though a hypothetical question okay. um not most questions are to be honest um if you were offered a job uh let's say I uh, uh, or somebody comes to your talk and they're you know the owner of a language academy in West Yorkshire. Uh, and they said to you, I'm the owner of a language academy in West Yorkshire, and I would like to offer you a job as a teacher and teacher trainer. Mm. What would be your reaction now that, you know, you're in another job, you're in a job that's perhaps more stable than a teaching job that mm. perhaps has a better wage than a teaching job. Mm -hmm. What would be your reaction if someone came along to you now and offered you that, that job? Well, first I'd be flattered. And then secondly, I'd, I'd ask for more information about the conditions because that's what it comes down to. We've, ta we've skirted around talking about teachers, you know, struggling, taking different, it comes down to working conditions. You know, it's not only about pay. What are mm -hmm. the hours? Am I paid for prep time? Um, you know, what about professional if not, development? I'm not prepping anything. <laughs> <laughs> no prep lessons. Uh, you can find lots of no prep lessons online, actually. There's yeah, some you great can. blogs. Yeah, yeah um, you, you can. It's not a great way to live day by day, though. No. Every now and again, it's really good. Like, I love it every yeah, now and again. Yeah. But yeah, well, as, a, as a kind of general rule, it's yeah. not fantastic. Well, we're not following along. We're not giving our learners what they need, right? We're, exactly. we're giving ourselves what's convenient for us. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I don't want to plan. Okay, I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
um, you know, professional development? Um, is, are, is there professional development in, at school? If not, is support offered to teachers who want to like work on their own self-driven professional development? Is there support if, we want, if a teacher wants to do things like go to a conference or, or things like that, or take an online course or do a diploma, uh, for mm -hmm. example? Um, because I, I mean, I saved up and paid for my diploma, but that takes time. Oof. Some people can't do that. Um, and you've got a mortgage as well. Wow. <laughs> I don't understand that. I don't know how that's humanly uh, possible. Especially well, with, with gas. You have to pay for gas and heat. Oh, that was before the... Yeah. That was before all that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, chose but, a good time uh, yeah, to do it. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, as Mark Knopfler says, got to feed the kids and put the diesel in the tank, right? Um, it, we yeah. all have to pay. Um, but, like, do, is the school a member of any um, in, associations? Because if a school's a member association, then there's certain uh, like regulations they're supposed to follow, and you know, um, are the teachers at the school unionized? Um, that's a huge thing. And there are, you, you know, Unite here in the UK um, has been accepting English language teachers since 2017. The TEFL Workers Union, um, uh, TOSIG, the Teachers as Workers Special Interest Group, is always like reaching out to teachers and trying to support them when they have difficulties at work. You know. Um, what's like the school facilities like? What are their, um, what's their, um, how are the teachers? What's the atmosphere? Is it professional? Is everybody really friendly? Do you do like outings? Or is it like a really toxic place where we're all fighting over books and who's the best teacher? And, uh, you know, are, are there observations? Like all these sorts of questions. Um, Who is the best teacher? <laughs> <laughs> Every teacher is the best teacher for at least one of their students. That's the thing. Like, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you're, you can't be the best for everyone, but I guarantee there's at least one student that you've had, that you've had a big impact on and you're their best teacher. Yeah. And that's a good feeling. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so yeah, I would ask about the conditions and if the conditions were, because as other teachers have said before, I might be willing to take a pay cut if it was for a good position at a school where, you know, I would be treated with respect and dignity and I wouldn't have to supply my own course materials or, or if I did, I would be, you know, there'd be support in that. Um, is there professional development opportunities? You know, would I have a mentor or, or be a mentor? Like, like what, what's the setup? And I think quite a lot of school owners would go, uh, to some of those questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Some of them wouldn't, though. Some of them would say, well, I have this and I have this and I have this and we have this professional development program. And if a teacher has been with us for a year, then they can apply for us to pay for half of uh, qualification, you know, all of this sort of stuff. And that was my experience when I worked at the British Council in Spain. Um, while I was there, uh, the British Council paid for me to do the TILEC, the Teaching Young Learners Extension Certificate. Mm -hmm. um, and had I stayed there longer, if COVID hadn't happened, I would have gone on to do a Delta or a DIP and they would have funded it. Yeah. Because, you know, the British Council saw it as professional development for their their employees only makes a better working environment. Everybody's more qualified. Everybody's more trained. Everybody's more positioned to help each other. The learners are getting a better service. Teachers are more, more, more confident and educated. It, it only benefits the business. They don't mind paying out in the short term for the long term positive impact. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, as I say... I was surprised when I went into the job that I've just started at First Direct. I was kind of not surprised, but the training is intense. I'm actually still in my training period at First Direct, even though I started oh, wow. on the 12th of December. Yeah, they have six weeks of training, um, three weeks of like sort of online module training where you learn a lot of um, sort of what would be the word? Uh, I mean, you learn all of the ins and outs of like banking. Okay. Um, terminology and 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 um, procedures how procedures mm -hmm. are done like so and then there's like software and you know all things like that um and then you have a mentor for a week or more where you, someone is right next to you as you are like working through tasks taking calls speaking to customers all of that and so you have an experienced um coach um that's the job i'd like to do in the future um who's 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 helping helping you and then after that you spend four weeks in what they call pod which is you are taking calls live. You don't have your mentor there anymore, but there's a help desk that you can okay. question at any time and they respond within a minute or two. So the first sort of six weeks, 
all of the support you could want, like personally, um, professionally, um, you know, getting paid on time. I was never paid on time at my last job. I was always, it was always one, two, three or four days late getting paid yeah. on time, getting paid the correct amount, paying tax. Shouldn't be a big ask. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know? no, it, it really shouldn't. The problem is mm. it, it, it really can be a huge ask this whole, you know, getting really? paid on time because a lot of the time, particularly, you know, in, in Spain or in other places as well, um, academies are, are kind of built by an ex-teacher who's like, mm. oh, well, I've got an opportunity here and I can build the academy. Perhaps they're not the greatest business people in the world. Perhaps mm. they're not the greatest managers in the world. And, you know, it gets to a point where, particularly if they've been around since any point near the early 2000s when there was a huge boom, mm. they have a lot of loyal students there. So, you know, they can end up just being massively overwhelmed. And then, yeah, mm. things like, you know, payments come late or, you know, the wrong amount of money goes in or, yeah. you know, all sorts yeah. of different things can was happen. Underpaid now, twice in my last year. Yeah, that's yeah. that's never ideal. Now, mm. I, what do you think it would mean to teachers if they had that kind of first, you know, the first couple of weeks, the first three, four weeks support mm-hmm. with you know the intensive training mm-hmm. and then the mentor? Now, that sounds kind of ideal for some things, but I think when I was a trainee teacher, if I'd had somebody breathing down my neck observing my all of my mm. first classes i might have not i might have got too nervous in that situation but mm. i think you know but also on the flip side of that if we all had that not just during our you know certificates if we had that in our first few weeks as teachers mm-hmm. we wouldn't look upon our observations or peer observations as being a terrifying thing it would just be yeah another one of those things that we did before and we're doing again so yeah. why not carry on with it so yeah it seems like a sensible idea yeah well um okay this uh, this seems like i'm going off on a tangent i promise i'll bring it back um one of my best friends several years ago bought a kitten and uh i love kitten tangents her, yeah i know oh, kittens are the best right why wouldn't i talk about kittens so um when he bought the kitten he bought also her carrier as in the thing that you put the cat in when you take him to the vet and he left it out and put some toys in it and encouraged her to play in on around it all the time. And so as she grew up, she's an adult cat now, it's been years. Um, the care and the carrier still like sits in the living room and it's played with and used and he uses it. To, he'll put her in it and carry her around just for fun sometimes or take her out for, you know, um, carrier does not equal vet terrible times. It's just part of her life, mm-hmm. you know? In the same way, um, relating that back to what we were just said, it just it would just normalize observations. If people popped in and out of our classes all the time, if our first week as a teacher we had an observer who was in most of our classes or several observers, we'd just get used to having another pair of eyes and getting some constructive criticism so that when observation time comes around, it's not a mad panic to have the best lesson I could ever have ever. Just, oh, someone's watching. Well, they've done that a million times before, so I'm just going to go in and do my best like I always do, and it'll be fine. Right. Yeah. So in the same, like, you know, as, as my friend Jack usualized the carrier for his cat, we should usualize observations for teachers so that it's not Absolutely. such a like stressful experience. 100%. Now we are going to um, shoot off for a couple of seconds, but when we come back, um, we're going to talk about, we've talked about your teacher. We've talked about your trainer. We're going to talk about your activist side when we return in about Sounds 30 good. seconds. So don't go anywhere. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. We are back. Um I'm just checking that I can I can hear Helen. Can I'm you hear sure me I can clearly? Hear I can I'm hear here. you. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, that's great. I, I've discovered that Podbean has fixed the bug of not being able to unmute guests. That was a a fairly distressing bug as a as a host, not being able to unmute guests. And Sounds and the stressful. unmute button isn't very easy to find when you're in the app as a guest. So. Don't worry, yeah, you're not I the never first person it. to struggle to find it. Well, there you go. <laughs> we have to save that for the next show, obviously. Um, <laughs> so before we we um, popped off to listen to, to John Cat there, um, we mentioned you are an activist. Mm-hmm. Um, now, 
I am not a huge fan of the word activist, not because I don't think activists are awesome. I think activists are amazing. Um, I think they've been given a negative uh, kind of connotation. The word has been given negative connotations. It shouldn't have. Absolutely, it shouldn't have. Um, I think people should be proud to be activists about you know whatever they're they're fighting for, um, as long as they're not harming others. In my opinion, mm. um, so the, the new the new word change maker has come around as well, um, mm. which I think is slightly different to an activist. But um, for what do you activize? <laughs> What do I act on? There you go. What do you act <laughs> Activists on? act, yeah. Well, they in my do. past, I was an actor. Anyway, um, well, in all honesty, what I act on is existing. Um, as, a, as a non-binary person, so someone whose gender is not male nor female, but somewhere in the middle or neither of those things, um, just existing and, and using um, um, MX, mix as a title instead of Miss, Ms or Mr., or um, asking people to use they them pronouns when they talk about me just some people would call like me existing and asking people to make those changes for me some people would call that activism um i wouldn't because i think as i say that's just my existence just who i am mm -hmm. and when people make a mistake if they accidentally use she her i don't really mind just calmly correct them usually they self-correct and go well, i'm really sorry helen no it's fine don't worry it's hard to adjust i don't mind um one of my very close non-binary friend mandy's i occasionally miss uh use the wrong pronouns for them so you know i know how it is um so some people say me existing in the way that i am is is activism you know by being the way i am i'm pushing my agenda or or throwing it in someone's face and oh. don't see it that way i just am sorry mm -hmm. i think you are blowing me a little out of proportion <laughs> um so yeah. let's look specifically at the you know mm. Not specifically at your existence, which which mm. is awesome, by the way. Um, <laughs> thank you for doing that, existing, yeah. by the way. Um, oh, it's, it's a pretty awesome thing to do. Yeah. Um, so let's look at you know the our world that we often talk mm. of, the, the ELT world mm -hmm. and um, the ELT sphere. And let's think a little bit about representation. Um, mm -hmm. Now... There are things slowly coming out about representation for the, mm -hmm. the LGBTQI plus community. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain people making noise about it and being mm -hmm. listened to. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about the, those people soon. Mm -hmm. um, and th the steps that have been taken, I'm going to say probably in the last five or six years, mm -hmm. are the babyest of steps like you can possibly imagine um <laughs> let's go back to the news that we listened to earlier the the mm. penultimate section on the news was about sex education and the fact that um most people had that there was zero talk of, of lgbtq with anywhere within the sex education which for me it would seem like kind of a logical place to start um yeah. you know to to educate people like the the, the whole sex education side of it mm -hmm. um but then i thought back to my sex education at school um you don't want to do that was, harry <laughs> well no it was it was the worst thing in the world mm -hmm. ever because mr goddard did it who was like a 60 year old horrible teacher the most uncomfortable person in the world Ooh. and he couldn't bring himself to say the word penis in class oh, no. and it's like we're doing sex education man and like, i remember joseph dean going over to him and just saying sir what's an erection just like no. and the awkwardness <laughs> of that moment so the fact that it, that doesn't seem like it's evolved all that much since then is is quite upsetting hmm. um but how do you feel about LGBTQ, um, where it is in... Oh, my dog is saying hello to everybody there. You can mm -hmm. stop barking, Hi, thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. Her name's Estrella. Uh, so yeah, the where is LGBTQ at the moment and where does it need to go? I'm just going to get rid of her. Yeah, that's okay, don't worry. So, um, I mean, this is a, a controversial discussion because uh, ELT is so global that English language teaching and English language teachers are operating in countries where it's still illegal to be 
um, a lesbian, to be gay, to be uh, trans or to be non-binary like me. Um, and so there are a lot of teachers who cannot do anything, even if they are gay themselves or, you know, non-binary themselves or trans themselves. They can't do or say anything in their classroom for fear of, you know, reprisal or retribution. Um, and then there are, you know, a lot of, of teachers in, who, who are operating in countries which, you know, where it isn't illegal to be, um, to be LGBTQ+. Um, from this point on, I'm just going to say queer because I think that's a little easier. I know for okay. some people that word is, is a bit hard because there's a history of it being used, you know, against um, the LGBTQ community. You know, you're queer. It was used as an insult in the same way that gay was used as an insult. But in the uh, colorful history of, of uh, this community, as usual, we have taken this label and worn it as a badge of honor. So quite a lot of people of my own age, I'm 32, um, use it just as a, as a term, whereas for people of older generations, they still remember it as a slur. But I'm going to be using it just as a description of people who are LGBTQ. So um, a lot of, you know, queer young queer teachers or teachers who are teaching in countries where it's not, not illegal or, or unsafe to be queer are still sort of finding that there is no representation in materials. Um, and this doesn't just stop at, at queer representation, but as a, as, a, as, a, as a quick example, when you study the family, I guarantee you that the textbook you're using probably has white mom, white dad, white baby, uh, white son, white daughter. It's the that's Simpsons, one, right? Yeah, Two it's and one, a half kids. <laughs> yeah, it's one thing that's slowly kind of... Um, in, in recent textbooks, you know, ones that I've seen, yeah. you know, new editions that are yes. coming out last year, this year, very slowly, there, yeah. is, there is slightly more representation. I, and I've even seen mm. in a textbook, um, there was a part about, you know, two uncles, you know, it's, it's, it, but, yeah. but it's, it's very, very, very rare. It, mm -hmm. It's, it's, well, it's, it's almost unheard of. Yeah. Well, because... I suppose if you look at it from the publisher's point of view, because ELT is global, they want to publish their book and sell it in as many countries as they can. And as I've said, um, you know, teaching English operates in countries where that's illegal and they won't be able to sell that book in that country. So they think, well, profit margins, I'm just going to take this out because I can't, I'll lose this area of, of my potential consumers. And so I, you know, but um, I, I, I mean, I would, I, to that, I would say, well, then just have multiple books. I don't see why that's a problem. That's <laughs> exactly it, especially with digital books nowadays as yeah. well. It's something that's, you know, easily, yeah. well, not easily rectified, but, you know, you can mm. you can change it. Yeah. When I, 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 And, uh, you know, seeing multiple moms or multiple dads or or seeing single moms and single, single dads, even single parents, we don't see mm -hmm. that, um, interracial couples or grandparents raising kids, like all of these situations really happen. Parents who, who have kids but are also caring for one or both of their elderly parents at home, you know, all these sorts of different family types um, really should be represented. Um, but another thing is that learners need to see themselves represented in, in the materials, you know, and at the last job I was at, the one where I was let go at the last minute, um, we were, te I was teaching majority um, learners from Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and UAE, so mostly uh, Muslim students. Uh, there was a whole unit in the book about New Year. Well, they don't celebrate New Year. So, useful. <laughs> yeah, not useful. So I, I normally would talk, I would, I, I expanded the lesson, changed it to talk about different holidays that they celebrate we you know we talked about ramadan and we talked about um eid and we talked about for example saudi national day most countries have a sort of like canada day saudi national day you know independence day they have a, like a day which celebrates unification or britain uh, doesn't have that no nope. they've got they've got guy fawkes night haven't they oh let's yep. celebrate the day that that person tried to get rid of the Blow parliament. parliament. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you know, fun fact, I think it's something like every 10 minutes, a country, one country somewhere in the world, uh, or no, every 10 days, something like that, a country around the world celebrates independence from Britain. Oh, that's... 
And I was like, whoa, okay. A fact I learned the other day, I'm going to have to look it up and get the correct number. But yeah, it's not that much. It's something like yeah, every 10 days or every two weeks. Yeah. 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 And I thought, ooh. So a lot of countries have like an independence or, or, or unification day. And so we talked about those. But um, it, it was a really an unnecessary kind of, you know, alteration. The, the, there were lots of things that the book could have done instead of New Year. I mean, consider mm -hmm. also Lunar New Year. A lot yeah. of Asian countries, not just China, we, we get into the habit of calling it Chinese New Year, but there are lots oh, of yeah. Asian countries that celebrate. Oh, yeah, there's New Tet Year. in Vietnam. And, yeah. And, you, know, it's, it's... you know, and, and, and a, a, a Christmas, mentions of Christmas in the book. And I'm like, okay, there is not just Christmas. There's also Kwanzaa and there's Hanukkah and like Yule and so many, you know, there, I think there's 13 different winter holidays, I think, maybe more. Um, so, you know. It, it, and I, I see where it's it is from the, the create the, the perspective of the materials creators like they have to know what audience they're creating it for but also publishers want a book that's as generic as possible so well, that's they can it. sell it's, it everywhere it, it, and yeah. yeah often it comes from you know you're asked to do can you write this book this this unit six will be around January for most European mm -hmm. countries. So we'll make it about New Year. So yeah. that's not relevant unless, uh, for example, maybe you're talking, you know, maybe you put in New Year's resolutions and turn it into the most sustainable New Year's party <laughs> ever. In which point, you know, you can talk yeah. about how you would have a party, you would make mm. it sustainable and you, you can connect it to something. You could connect it to a New Year's party. You could connect it to yeah. Lunar New Year. You could connect it to... Yeah you know, Halloween, because, yeah. you know, why not? That's a massively wasteful celebration. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's another thing, I suppose, is that climate change doesn't often turn up as a theme in our, in our books. And if it does, it's sort of like, we've done the climate change unit, now we're moving on sort of thing. And, and we've talked before about, hearkening back to earlier in our conversation, you know, teachers an unpaid work are they paid for prep time when teachers such as yourself talk about sustain like making their lessons sustainable or touching on um, themes of sustainability or climate change or diversity as we've been talking about now um, teachers need time and resources mm -hmm. to create those extensions and alterations to the book to the materials that they're using is that time paid is that time appreciated? Um, you know, so there's there's all of that as an aspect as well. There was a, a really great um, uh, webinar given by Ashley Moore. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Ashley Moore. Um, mm -hmm. And he talked about, he, he, he had created like a practical taxonomy for, for challenging um, hetero and cis normativity and TESOL materials. And there were sort of like, there were five types of representation that you could see in, in English language teaching materials, the, the students' books. Um, yeah. So first, bottom, like the most damaging was explicit discrimination. So like the people who made the book purposefully thought, well, we're not including any of those queers and kept them out of the book. Everything is white, straight and middle class. Yeah. Um, everything is very cis and heteronormative. Everybody is probably Caucasian, that sort of thing. Um, and then, and that was done explicitly on purpose, which is of course quite damaging. Um, mm -hmm. and then next up is normative erasure. So in this one, the, the materials writer who's creating the materials just hasn't thought of it because they're, they're following their normal impulses while creating this, these images, the, this, this, um, vocabulary, these key terms, this grammar point, as they're building the materials, they don't think about diversity and representation. It just doesn't occur to them because they're that's just how working on a timeline that was for right, yesterday. Yeah. You know, yeah. you need it yesterday. So you just come up with what you've yeah. done in a previous book or you look at a different thing and you're like, yeah. this, this, this. And there's not that kind of pause yeah. at all. Yeah. And so it, it is erasure, but it's like thoughtless. It wasn't done explicitly or on purpose. Nobody thought, oh, we're going to keep out those, you know, those people. Nobody thought that, but they also didn't think about inclusion either. Mm -hmm. um, and so then the, 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 the third and sort of middle of the road is marginalized inclusion. Uh, people nowadays would call that like box ticking or oh, yeah. I have to have, if we're watching tokenism. Yeah, tokenism. We have to have one person of color. We have to have one, um, you know, queer person. We have to have, you know, uh, we just ticked the box. They're there, so it's fine. Um, and yes, it's inclusion. 
technically right because they've been included but it's marginalized right mm -hmm. they're they're not the center of attention it's still like the hetero and cis uh, and white people who are rich you know middle class whatever uh, people who are central in in the um in in the materials uh, so the next step up which is where i think a lot of a lot of conscious material writers and a lot of english language teachers who are starting to think about inclusion and representation who are starting to consider that the especially people who teach kids and teenagers they have access to the internet mm -hmm. I, I wish when i was a teenager i i i could have just looked up what non-binary was and known oh that's me yeah. easy didn't know that until i was in my mid-20s i didn't encounter the label until then so i just didn't know right um and so kids now, like I taught some teenagers in Spain a few years ago when I was still living in Spain. One of them said to me, oh, yeah, one of my friends is non-binary. Like kids know they can look up information anytime. Oh, I'm a boy and I have feelings for other boys. I know that means I'm gay. I might be bisexual. Do I like girls too? I, you know, like they, they can answer those questions and they can search for information. So um, the next step would be mainstreamed, edu mainstreamed inclusion. So mainstreaming, meaning that you have sort of equi equal representation, more or less, you know, there are four, four photos of people um, and two of them are gay men who are together. And then there's a woman of color who's black, for example, and then there's um, an, an Asian man, for example. And so, you know, we've got some diverse groups on there and they're forefront, they're mainstreamed, they're part of it. Uh, but then, uh, and, and, and that's sort of, I think a lot of people are trying to move towards that, towards like mainstreaming. Sometimes we talk about normalizing. Um, I kind of don't like that term, to be honest, because I'm normal. You don't need exactly. to normalize me. I'm here. Uh, I like yeah, the well, usualizing, like usualizing. Yeah. betting, usualizing, because I'm already here and I am normal. But let's usualize the idea of, of queer people, of people of color, um, that sort of thing. Um, and so the, the top ideal he had was critical inclusion, the idea of we're being inclusive and we're being critical about it. So um, I'm including this this um, woman of color who's in a relationship with another woman. And, um, you know, there are a lot of negative stereotypes about black women and the, and the jobs that they do. So instead of making her this job, which people expect, She's instead going to be this job and her partner is going to be, the, you know what I mean? And they're, they're purposefully, critically building um, materials which address, you know, marginalized groups and not only queer people, as I said, but yeah. And so, so that's like a critical awareness as you're working. I think um, one of the, yeah. the really important aspects to that as well is when they're making the examples, they make real examples. Find... Yeah a real person that yeah. does that you know find yeah. a real asian female scientist at nasa yeah. to put in the book it doesn't yeah. have to be you know this is a picture of an asian woman who is a doctor and it's clearly a stock <laughs> photo of an yeah. of an asian it's like no, no this is you just trying to put it make the stories real make them about real people there are real people that do amazing things everywhere yeah. it's, it's something i'm trying to work on at the moment and it's it's an mm. issue i had with with a, a course book that's used here in spain um and each of the each each unit has a quote at the start of it and mm -hmm. of the 10 quotes nine of them were by white men and the other one was by helen keller um yeah. and that's not to say helen mm. keller's not awesome helen keller is awesome everything she yeah. did was absolutely incredible mm -hmm how many 13 year old students will know who that is at a glance you know yeah. maybe you'll go in to look at who it was and, and like you know read deep into to Helen Keller's background but most likely they'll look at it they'll read the quote that'll be it what I'm trying to do at the moment with a, a project I'm working on is include mm -hmm. a quote for for each of the 12 lessons mm -hmm. but actually look at who's made the quote and it's not just you know Albert Einstein. Some some white dude who's saying it. Yeah, it's not or, or Al Gore, to be honest, you know, because yeah. it's about sustainability. So yeah. often people go, bam, let's go to Al Gore or let's look at Bill Gates. And it's like, 
no, let's not look at those people. There are well, all sorts of other people involved in the yeah. movement. You know, it's, First it's, Nations, you know, for like Aboriginal and First Nations community has been practicing sustainability for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah, and they've got exactly. lots to say about it. So <laughs> what, like, there is there is a case study um, with mm. indigenous uh, communities, of course, um, mm. in the in the. Uh, the project in the project mm, so yeah it's it's, it's it's pretty exciting but you know these are things that i've, I've learned as I've, I've been going along that i've seen other things that that aren't exactly right and you know we talk about you know the climate crisis being a part of our our materials we mentioned that and how it you know often it's mm. it's not there enough or, or it's in the background now, something we don't ever talk about um is is climate justice you know we'll talk yeah. about climate change or cl the climate crisis whatever you want to call it i want to call it the climate crisis um we'll talk about it and we'll mention it and even then we'll show you know the floods in germany a couple of years ago or mm. the bushfires in australia or in california Flint water crisis in uh, in the usa well there you go yeah. but if you look at the if you look at the Flint water crisis what you you, you head, tend to be looking at then yes you're looking at a, a you know a inverted commas developed nation but it is affecting you know the, the poorest people in society whereas we usually look at oh look germany that has been flooded or and we don't look at where we need to be looking the areas that are most affected by the climate crisis you yeah. know look at pakistan last year they were flooded while it was 51 degrees yeah. you know it, this is this is insane and it gets on the news for five minutes but floods this could be in the textbook where it talks about the floods in Germany to make it, you know, to have that local connection. But it can also talk about the floods in Pakistan. Mm. It can also talk about these other things. So like one rise thing up I tried to... Exactly, exactly. Mm. So I like to, to make sure my students do feel a connection to, to what they're doing. And, yeah. you know, 70% of the students um, will be white, straight people. Mm. So... I want them to be able to connect to the materials, but yeah. there also needs to be the other aspect that they also need to see that they haven't seen that they need to connect with and understand. Yeah. And and there's no difference between, you know, if, if you're teaching 14 year old boys, there's no difference between a 14 year old boy who's gay and a 14 year old boy who isn't. Like, honestly, they're going through this, a lot of the same issues. Oh, yeah. like this is happening to me. And oh, I'm suddenly interested in these people and I wasn't before and, and you know, <sighs> What's the difference? You know, I find that there's no need to exacerbate differences between communities. We can all relate to each other. You know, I, even though I'm non-binary, this doesn't mean I can't relate to my cisgendered friend. You know, my partner is cisgendered, and you know, he's a guy. But there are a lot of things that we have in common. A lot mm -hmm. of struggles we've shared, or or we're similar ways we can relate to each other. So you know, there's there's no reason f to to create materials which only show your students as well. Um, and I think you'd be, as I say, we'd be surprised. Young people are really, really on it. Like they oh, are, they, so they know. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they can on. access any information online that they want. They can look up what is the climate crisis. Well, they yeah. And they up. want to know about it. They yeah. want to be taught about it. They don't want to yeah. only learn through memes. They want to learn yeah. from somebody, you know, who's, yeah. you know, and, and going on that journey with your students, if they help you learn about, you mm. know, inclusion or the LGBTQI plus community, like, if you're on that journey with them, that will be even better. You know, you'll share yeah. that learning journey with your students. Now, yeah. to go back to, to materials um, and writing materials, mm -hmm. um, there is, it is a difficult thing. People are mm. trying to do stuff about it. Um, yeah. I've talked about Peter J. Fulliger in the past and the wonderful materials that he creates. Yeah, Tyson Seaburns as well. I was about yeah. to mention Tyson, of course. And, and, <laughs> Name uh, drop. I've, uh, I've had him on twice, actually. So Yeah, um, yes, I've seen. And um, you've also had Jordan Putman on as well, haven't you? I have indeed. Yeah. Uh, a fellow Sevillano. He's uh, <laughs> he's based here in Seville. So yeah. um, I, I did indeed. But yeah, I'd, I'd like to look at something that I noticed today, actually, on LinkedIn. I'm not sure mm. if you've seen it yet. But Tyson mm. will be doing a talk in November um, mm. about... Uh, it's it's called now i've got it up here because i didn't want to forget i didn't want to upset tyson by forgetting the the uh the name of it um you're writing or editing materials with lgbtq plus narratives how's it going um like that's the name of the talk and it's yeah 
it's kind of a check-in, I guess, because, you know, he wrote the book. Uh, he literally wrote how the book, to, How to yeah, Write Inclusive how to Materials. How to Write Inclusive Materials. I'm looking at it on my desk right now. <laughs> there you go. Oh, mine's in my ebook. Damn it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be, well, I, I don't know, but I, I'm hoping it's going to be like a check-in, you mm. know, with some maybe some more ideas would be nice. Um, it's a process, right? It really is a process. And you can't know everything about everything. No, you know, I don't know everything about climate change and sustainability. It is mm. what I've been studying. It's been my passion for, you know, 10 years. But, mm. you know, there's still a lot for me to learn. And, yeah. and with what I'm writing, with what I'm doing, I'm learning more and more every day. And it's the same with inclusion. I, mm -hmm. as a teacher, I want everybody to feel included. And mm -hmm. as any teacher should want their students to learn and feel included. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't yeah. feel included, it's much harder to learn. Now, even if you are, you know, uh, incredibly religious and it's, you know, you decide to choose those four sentences from the Bible to, to fuel your bigotry, um, mm. even if that's the case, you should still want the best for your students. You should still yep. want them to be included and you should want them to be happy. If they are not hurting other people, yeah. they should feel at home in the class yeah. because they won't be hurting other people by being gay you know that, no. that's that doesn't hurt that doesn't hurt me if 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 i if i walk past a gay person in the street it's exactly the same as walking past a straight person in the street yep. it's no effect on my life so yep. as a teacher they sh we should be pushing those boundaries and even within ourselves and questioning our own kind of mm. bias and usualizing as you said and earlier. usualizing yeah. of course yeah um yeah and I mean, I, I think it's it's important because if, as I say, if you teach young people, they might be questioning things about themselves. They need to hear positive reinforcement, um, and and also you might find that young people, if you're teaching young learners or, or teen learners, you'll find that they are probably already quite educated about it in in their own language. I bet you experience in your in your classes, Harry, students bringing up local environmental issues. Or, or or things that are going on in their local community because yep. th they hear about it in the news or their friends are talking about it or or I have a friend who 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 did this this uh, you know activity the other day or or I have a friend who is queer you know all this sort of stuff and you know they they know and they have their own input so a lot of teachers um, who are sort of quasi material writers themselves have started you know doing that bringing their own their learners experiences into the classroom well. We could go on a long talk about dogma and and <laughs> and um, you know everything that we're getting from that. And I've done it myself, you know, um, bringing things from the learners and having a learner-centered classroom, bringing in their experiences and the things that they see, the things they want to learn about. They know it in their own language. Now they want to do it in English, you know, all those sorts of things. And you can create like it's meaning making right there and they'll remember the English language they learned when they did it because it had meaning to them yeah. um, and I think that that's really important with any issue you discuss in the English language classroom whether it's inclusion or the climate crisis or anything you know it has and, to have meaning to them so they'll remember it exactly and, yeah. and that it's, it's so easy to mm -hmm. to transmit these ideas you know mm -hmm. it's it's not a difficult thing to, to get your head around if you're learning it for the first time. If you're, mm. you know, there are people who struggle with a lot of things because they're relearning their ideals that they had in the yeah. past. These ideas like, what do you mean there's more than two genders? That's impossible. You know, this is, this is biology. Things cannot <laughs> change. This is from history. You know, there are people that think that, but children don't because you can teach them a new thing. Now we were teaching pronouns today in class. We would, mm going through well we're actually going through trying to use the verb to be as well and shapes and, and all sorts of things but we were just going through you know i we uh he she you for you you for you as yeah. like more people um yeah. with spanish it's easy because you've got yeah. tu and, and vosotros yeah. um but then they as well and it was yeah. like they for, for various people, but they for the singular. And the, yeah. the students kind of looked and were like, what? You know, singular they, and you know, you explain it and it's, it's mm. not difficult for, for students yeah. to understand. And and there's, I remember reading an, an excellent um, anecdote um, and it was about uh, somebody left, left their wallet in McDonald's 
you know, uh, and wow. they'd left it on the cash desk and they'd, somebody had come along and, and they had handed it in to the, the person who was selling and, and they'd pass it on to their manager. The whole time, it's perfectly clear that something has happened by individual people using they. It's not that difficult. We've done it forever when we don't know exactly, um, you know, if we're trying to refer to a he or a she or, or, a, or a they. So it's not a difficult concept to understand. No. And it's not, sometimes it's not important. You know, maybe it's not important what the other person's gender is, just that the phone was forgotten and that it was handed in and that it was passed. It doesn't matter whether that person is, is male or female or neither, <laughs> as long as yeah. the story unfolds, right? Well, but the story is about the thing yeah. that's been lost, you know, yeah. the story is about that. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. But also, I mean, you know, it also sometimes gender isn't disclosed. Oh, Helen, I'm meeting my cousin this weekend. Oh, how are they? I don't, yeah. they didn't say their cousin, right? Oh, one of my students left their phone behind. I don't know which students it is. I'll take their phone to the receptionist and I'm sure they will come back for it. Yeah. You know, we do it all the time naturally. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in some languages, this translates easily because they have an equivalent and in some it doesn't. And so, you know, learners, I guess, are sometimes it's a simple translation issue for them. And sometimes it's not. And they have to, you know, wrap it's, their it's, minds around this whole other pronoun that's new to them. Yeah, it's very tricky in Spanish. Um, yeah. Having a gendered language. It's yeah, it's very difficult um, for people to get their heads around um, yeah. because it is adding in a whole new word basically you know they've, they've, mm. there's now ellas which is not yeah. ella or ello it's ella mm. um yes and it's for me wonderful um but for me it's much easier in english because we just use they it's it's yeah. much easier um so yeah uh sorry that was my, my little rant there i apologize <laughs> I, I pronouns that's okay it's, no. it's 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 such an easy thing to teach and it's another really easy thing to teach is love you know, yeah. if, you know, it, oh, Uncle Kevin's um, married to a man. Why is that? Oh, it's because he loves him. Oh, brilliant. There you go. End of discussion. Oh, yeah, that, that's it. That was yeah. it. There's no kid going, what What do you mean? What? No, they, they don't care. Yeah. They don't say. They know. Yeah. But that, they know. Oh, oh, so you love you love your partner. Brilliant. Um and Uncle Kevin loves Uncle Kevin's partner. There you go. That's why. It's done. Oh, yeah. So it's simple. Very easy. And the younger the learner, the easier it is. And yep. as you say, teenagers nowadays are so much more in tune with these kind of things. And it's not They're very a taboo. <laughs> it's not a weird thing to talk about. It's just mm. it ne and it needs to be talked about and it needs yeah. to be discussed. Probably with them leading the conversation. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. I think it there was a, a survey done, I think, about five years ago in Canada. So in Canada, to set your expectations. And it was something like 42% of people under the age of 20 uh, di uh, did not identify as, um, as cisgendered and or um, heterosexual. 40%, that's almost half. So yeah. the kids that you're teaching do not fall into the binaries that you're accustomed to now. And we have to meet their needs, right? Because, yeah. you know, they have to see themselves represented and see, oh, that's like me. Th that story is like me. Oh, I, I relate to that. I understand that. That's like me. And, and every learner deserves to be able to have that moment of, aha, it's me. Aha, it's yeah. like me. They all need to be able to have that. Um, yeah. And, and also have the safety to be able to say yeah. what they want to say and not have, have the fear. And mm. I fear that you see that segue there. I fear our well time done. is running out. Yes. <laughs> um, time flies like the wind. Yeah. Fruit flies like bananas. There's a <laughs> hilarious English teacher joke for you. Um, oh boy. <laughs> there you go. Take um, take that into your next English lesson. Yeah. If you dare to use that IATFL, I will I will put you on the best pedestal in the history of time. Although I won't be there, so I won't be able to see it. Uh, you could just lie to me and say you said it, and I'll put you up on that pedestal. Anyway. We can we can only hope that in future IATFL will be um, hybrid and or recorded so that people can attend from long distances. Exactly. My um, pre-conference event was last year. 
there you the, go. The, the prawn sig conference event was so let's hope that in future it'll be more accessible that way fingers crossed it's been a pleasure mm-hmm. thank you so much um i hope to hear from and speak to you again in the near future mm-hmm. um, it has been an absolute pleasure i will be back next week i think um let me just double check it's not next week on my way it's the week after yes i am back next week ah with one of my favorites dj tomato will be joining me um find out more next week um when i speak to to the legendary dj tomato until then thank you so much and i'll hear you next week you've been listening to teachers talk radio Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.